felt watching it. It feels like momentous. And don't get me wrong, I worked very hard for it and I was really proud of myself. But uh, even a week later, I remember graduating. It depends which college you go to. I went to Queen's and the certificate was absolutely pathetic looking. And moreover, there was no mention of the class of degree on it. Everyone got the exact same computer printout. I remember thinking, for the rest of my life, I can't actually prove I get this, <laughs> like, you know, unless I mention it when it's not even provoked, for example, now. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my dad saying that as well. My dad saying, my dad's a teacher, and he, um, he got his job as a teacher without ever giving any uh, proof of any of his academic qualifications. And it was about... 20 years later, the Ofsted came in, and, and luckily he did have a real degree. <laughs> uh, but there were people there that hadn't, didn't have the degree in the subject that they, they were teaching. In some cases, didn't even have any teaching degrees. It may have changed now. Certainly in the 70s, I get the impression you could basically just show up and say, yeah, I'm a teacher, and you'd get a job. <laughs> um, and uh, although that is a, slightly, it's a slight exaggeration, um, and it is worth being proud of if you do get a good degree, but... The amount that, uh, that the rest of the world cares about it, I definitely overestimated at the time. <laughs> Do you know what the guy who had the Times column was doing now? He's still the theatre director, okay. but I don't think he's a journalist anymore. I'm still not exactly in touch with him, but uh, I do hear from him through other people. And, um, and the thing is, we became friends. It was not as if he was making any specific attempt to belittle me either. It, he was just like a lot of people in Freshers' Week, eager to talk about what he'd done, and unfortunately there was loads of it. And so and I became competitive with him without him even really asking for it. Um, as I say, a lot, of, a lot of my early time here was spent in uh, kind of forced competition with people, and then you do start to realise that there is room, there's room in the <coughs> university for more than one person to do well and stuff. So we were talking before a bit about Edinburgh, and how the first, so you just said the first time you went to Edinburgh was as a student with Footlights. Um, I was just yeah. wondering, firstly, how do you think it's changed over, I used to think it was such a huge experience, but how do you think it's changed over those years? Yeah, the first Edinburgh Festival I did was in 2000, as and this is before the Footlight Show, in fact. So this was my first venture of any kind, really, into doing this sort of thing. It was an ADC uh, play, which, um, and it, I suppose it's, uh, yeah, it must still happen. Anyway, in those days, the ADC would take a couple of shows to Edinburgh on a footing which uh, is now, it seems quite privileged now because um, virtually all plays in Edinburgh make uh, some sort of a financial loss uh, because the, you're just there for too long to justify, unless you, unless it happen to be, huge audiences for what you're doing. For example, a hip-hop version of The Tempest. Um, in fact, that's the weirdest irony of all. If you've ever been to the Edinburgh Festival or been anywhere near it or been to any theatre festival, you'll know that the one thing you'll always get is about 18 different versions of The Tempest. So that would be, I should think, a commercially ruinous thing to do. My thing was a new play that I'd written and which the ADC took up there. And because of the way the funding certainly worked then, probably still does work, they could absorb a bit of a loss without um, it being a disaster. What it meant was we... Uh, we had like 12 people a day for 20 days and the economics of that I don't think worked out very well but it was kind of fine um, in terms of how the festivals changed it, uh, a lot of people um, are nostalgic about the Edinburgh Festival in much the same way as people sometimes talk about Glastonbury um, that it used to be um, people used to just show up and uh, no advertising and they would just do a show where they put a firework up their ass and everyone would love it and um, if you listen to, I'm not even, I'm sort of exaggerating, but there was a man that used to do that. That was his act. <laughs> and, and not just in Edinburgh. There was, a, there was a bloke that toured as a comedian successfully for some years. And um, his act was uh, just, yeah, he would just, he would light a firework up his bum. And um, I mean, I never saw this, so I'm just passing on what I've heard. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely true. I can almost, his name was Chris something. Anyway, P um, veteran comedians talk as if the Edinburgh Festival used to be all that just crazy, feckless acts of experimentation which somehow funded themselves through. And no, that is not really true. As with Glastonbury, as with any festival that begins as a uh, non-mainstream arts festival and attracts a following, people tend to talk about the old days as if it was all fields. But it is true that Edinburgh has become a much harsher, uh, more brutal and more commercial environment. Uh, there are far more shows than there used to be the Edinburgh Festival. Again, because comedy is simply a bigger thing, live comedy, than it used to be. So when I was going up there, already it was a big festival, but in those 15 years it has become, uh, you might say, bloated. There are now more stand-ups in Edinburgh than there are people to go and watch. So some people are left with pitiful crowds, and um, the festival is very long. 27 nights is a long time to do a show to three or four people. It can literally be as bad as that if your show is struggling. There is a um, famous story, but I don't think it's an urban myth. I'm pretty sure it's true, 
about a guy, a comedian that did his show who just won person. Um, the lights went down, it was just one guy in the audience, and he thought, well, I've, I've really, I've got to do it. Some people wouldn't do that. Some people would just take the guy to the pub. That's what I would do. This guy did the whole show, and then to the, and the other person, was obviously, there was no, no laughter. The person was just mortified, just sat there. So a terrible standoff. <laughs> and at the end of the hour, the lights came up, and it turned out it was just a coat hanging on a chair. <laughs> and, um, that's an extreme example of Edinburgh misfortune, but that is... Um, that's one of the odd things about the Edinburgh Festival. It <laughs> now has the veneer of professionalism. Loads of people do go as well. If you do a successful show, you will get two, 300 people a night. And so the top end of the Edinburgh Festival is now highly professional and, um, and uh, lucrative for a handful of people, um, gets a certain amount of TV coverage. But the bottom 80% of the Edinburgh Festival is still that. It's still people scrambling for audiences, scrambling in a pool that's just not got quite enough people in it. Uh, and too many performers, not quite enough uh, audience members. A little bit like the internet, really. Too many bloggers, not enough readers. Uh, the the universe is like that these days, I think. Uh, and uh, but Edinburgh was Edinburgh was full of too many people communicating before it became the general way of the world. So I'm guessing, in a way, do you think, like over your career going to Edinburgh, you sort of flipped from being scrambling for audiences to the more professionalised version of things? Yeah, I was quite fortunate. I had a fortunate trajectory um, in that. When I was first doing solo shows in Edinburgh, which was, well, my first one was 2005, uh, 10 years ago, there were not yet enough uh, comedians that you would kind of sink beneath the, um, the weight of newcomers. In my year, there were still quite a number of people who'd gone on to become well-known names. Rod Gilbert, Jason Manford, Tim Minchin, uh, and I all did our first shows in 2005, but uh, there weren't too many people beneath the level of, sort of promising newcomers. Nowadays, you can be very good uh, newcomer in Edinburgh and still be just dwarfed by the sheer volume of other shows. So it's much harder to stand out. I was lucky to, inf and not just in Edinburgh, but in my career in general, I was lucky to, um, to start doing stand-up at a time where if you were even fairly good, you would be able to make a name for yourself quite quickly. That's no longer the case. Um, the flip side is that the, there are far more TV shows now, there are far more opportunities now in comedy um, than there ever were, but the competition for those opportunities is ten times as fierce as it was when I was there. If I was doing a, a debut Edinburgh show now, regardless of the quality of it, I wouldn't be confident that anyone would uh, pay any attention to it, which makes it quite a punishing place to go as a newcomer. Um, I was just fortunate, purely by accident of, um, of when I started and how old I am, to be slightly ahead of that curve, so I became one of Edinburgh's sort of better known acts uh, just before it became oversubscribed. And once you're in that position, all you have to do is keep going. I say all you have to do. I mean, it, it, it does involve basically flogging yourself to death every August. And you, if you're not careful, you spend a lot of the year preparing the show and so you become completely obsessed with it. But Edinburgh remains quite an important landmark in a, in a comedian's career. It's sort of, it's not quite the World Cup's not quite the right um, analogy, but it, 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 well Wimbledon I suppose is the right analogy. Being a comedian and not going to Edinburgh would feel a bit like not going to Wimbledon as a tennis player. You can miss one if, for example, you've got an ankle injury um, or a back, like, or no, what's Nadal's thing? A knee. Anyway, you can do that, but if you miss two or three, people would start to say he's looking slow, uh, his ground strokes aren't there. I would have liked to be a professional sports person, by the way. So um, uh, that could never have happened even at the time, but the way I've compensated is by being a comedian that I think of it almost purely in terms of sport. Do you, do you ha did you have any like coat hanger moments where you just had like awful shows as Edinburgh when you were younger? Yeah, uh, not too many with my own shows, but one of the things that happens uh, at the Edinburgh Festival is that you, you do a, there are a lot of late night shows, which especially if you're young and uh, energetic, you do in order to boost your, your crowds. Like the idea is that if people see you at two in the morning, they might then come and see your proper show. And um, a lot of those shows were and are virtually unplayable because there's either nobody there or there's drunk Scottish people there and it's a toss-up which way you'd prefer it to go really or there's a couple of drunk Scottish people there but not enough for a gig but the people that are there are angry. Um, <laughs> it's a sort of um, unfortunate exponential thing that if you do a gig, especially in a place like the Edinburgh Festival with four or five people, not only is that not enough people for a proper audience but the four or five themselves are self-conscious which means that they are even sort of less enthusiastic than four or five people would normally be. And I did one in a room, in a way not unlike this in size, so it, w it could have held three or four hundred people, but there were um, only ten people there, and eight of them were the acts. 
Um, so two audience members, two genuine audience members. <laughs> so there was a kind of code of honour that we all had to stay. We all stayed to watch each other perform. But the person that was running the gig had to be running it at quite a loss. And by the way, it was about one in the morning as well. And I was on near the end. So my stage time was something like quarter to three, which even when I was younger and more fresh faced, I thought this is a bit late now. <laughs> um, and uh, when it starts to be morning in most of the world, it's probably time to go to bed where you are. And um, this, uh, also nobody was having a good gig because you couldn't really in that environment. So the evening was just getting worse and worse. It was later and later. And um, one of the acts made the uh, understandable error of just saying, well, this is a terrible, act. this is shit. Why are we all here? Um, to get laughs, and he was right to do it. But the promoter of the gig sprang up and started I can only describe it as a nervous breakdown, really. <laughs> she just started screaming, going, none of you have ever given me a chance. I, this could have been a great show, which it couldn't have been, I, from what I've described. It was never going to be anything other than a car crash. So this could have been great. None of you respect me, which was true, in fact. Um, <laughs> but we respect her. Obviously, you respect someone less the more time they spend screaming about the lack of respect the world has given them. Then she broadened it out and just started shouting, no one's ever given me a chance. I've done everything by myself. She started bitterly saying that she'd grown up in Oldham uh, in Greater Manchester, which again, is maybe hadn't an easy start for her, but it wasn't our fault. Um, <laughs> and then we, those of us who were acts started trying to sort of mollify her, saying, look, sorry, he's just trying to get laughs and it's fine. And, but she'd gone crazy by this time and she was saying, no, everyone out, everyone out. <laughs> and I hadn't even been on the stage yet. Uh, it's nearly three in the morning and I'd been there for three hours just in the hope of getting, f and by the way, the, the amount of time you'd be on stage was like five minutes as well. I'd hung around, as had the other acts, for three or four hours, just on the promise of this crap five minutes in front of a, an uninterested, nearly asleep crowd. So I didn't even really want to do the gig anymore, but I certainly didn't want to be made to not do it. Um, but there was nothing we could do. The, the woman just started going around, the few audience members and the acts, just barking at them, get out, get out. <laughs> um, so we found ourselves all just in this bar at three in the morning. Some of us had performed, some of us hadn't. And... Um, all you can do is say, well, that show doesn't go down as a success, really. I remember a couple of us, the bar was still open, so a couple of us tried to revive the gig in the bar, <laughs> just with punters that didn't even know a comedy show was meant to happen. But as you can imagine, at three in the morning in Edinburgh, yeah, I mean, if you're the sort of people that are in a bar where a comedy show is adjacent to it, but you've not gone on for the show, you probably don't want to see someone from England <laughs> do come. So that didn't work out either. That probably remains my worst Edinburgh experience, and I hope it will stay that way because I'd like to think I wouldn't put myself in a situation. These days, as you um, get more experienced and become more successful, you don't need to put yourself in situations as bad as that. But when you're uh, early in your career as a comedian, and by early I mean for at least five years, you are so desperate for any gig, so keen to um, develop as a comedian. And none of this is paid either, it goes without saying. It's not about earning money. You just want to get on stage and, um, and get experience and get better, so you'll pretty much perform anywhere. I did a gig in a leisure centre once, um, and there were people bouncing around on trampolines, and there was no microphone, I had to ask them, and I asked for a microphone, and the guy looked at me like, like I'd made quite an unreasonable request, so I just had to shout, and it does go through your head, I mean, this is fine, but I am shouting at people on trampolines, <laughs> it's, I, it's not exactly a job, this. So do you think, in some ways, like, once you leave Cambridge, you kind of lose the, the ability to get audiences quite easily? Well, uh, one of the great things about Cambridge is there is such a tradition of, um, uh, of performing art, of theatre, comedy, music, really everything, and people are so supportive of it that, yeah, you can y y you possibly get spoilt by um, people's appetite. But plus, um, and I, again, I don't, I, I'm speaking uh, as someone that hasn't been here for a number of years now, but uh, there used to be regular Footlights nights, and I'm sure there still are. Uh, the, my college even had a theatre, like most colleges that would put on. There's such a, there's such a, a calendar of events the whole time that... I don't remember, I, I put on a, two or three plays at Queen's and a couple of shows at the Playroom, the ABC. I don't remember ever worrying about audiences. It, it might not always be full, but people would show up. There always people would come for stuff. Um, and that definitely ill prepares you for, for mm. how hard it is um, in most. There aren't many places like Cambridge where people are so eager to see stuff. I mean, in London, obviously there are audiences to be had, but they're split between literally hundreds of events every night. Cambridge is kind of ideal because uh, there's an audience that's thirsty for stuff like comedy or for theatre for everything but there's and there's all there's stuff going on but there's never quite enough stuff that the audience is too fatally split 
Mm. Even here, I'm competing with um, garden parties, with the fact that it's May week, with the hangovers of three balls last night, and with people getting ready for balls tonight. And there's still enough people here for this not to be embarrassing. Yeah, um, uh, away from Cambridge, I, I, you definitely have uh, much. I do remember getting involved in the economics of shows, tr trying to sell them out you know, here. I remember giving out flyers. It wasn't like I was oblivious to the difficulty of attracting audiences, but the concentration of willing uh, theatre goers within the Cambridge community is probably out of proportion with where, what you get anywhere mm -hmm. else. And it's certainly out of proportion with what you, what you, you know. You can be quite a big name in Cambridge terms. So you do a show, you do a play, people know about you, you will, you'll get the crowds. Going from that to being 24, 25 and being adrift in London, uh, performing every night in front of eight people, running across London to do two or three gigs in the same night, just to try and get as many in as possible. Um, it, all of it would be quite a difficult transition, except that I found, um, I don't think I was spoiled by being here, I, I think it just made me... Um, because the flip side is after three years in this environment you do start to want to unleash yourself on uh, on a, a wider audience and there are big advantages to performing away from Cambridge as well I knew that every gig I did while I was a student here not many but the performing I did do while I was here there'd be people from uh, my college people that I would see in the street the next day and that is quite inhibiting it's, it is a liberation when you start doing gigs and you can look into the audience and think however bad this is I'll probably never see any of you again there is th there's never a time in Cambridge where you can do that, especially mm. Cambridge. It, really, it is so small. If you have the worst gig of your life in Cambridge, the chances are the next day someone will cycle past you that's all right. And so that, I think, does... Plus, it's not healthy to be constantly doing gigs that, that go well because your mates are there. You do need to break out of that. Mm. I remember the whole time I was doing things here, even at Footlights and even at AC, I would think, oh, I've, brought, I've brought five or six people to see this, so I can't entirely... It's not until you... Uh, have an audience entirely of strangers that you're really confident that you're not just being indulged by people. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask that a couple more things before we brought it out. So how, how you, do you have any views on how you think Queens might go tonight? How the audience will react? Well, it's hard to know. I'm doing the Queens Ball tonight. And um, it's quite a few years since I went to a ball. Um, in, in my earlier, in earlier years as a comedian, I did perform at quite a handful, including Queens, which was my own college. Um, and they really did vary. I, I remember the last time I did Queens, it was quite a successful exercise. On the other hand, I remember going on at Girton at four in the morning, and um, suffice to say, it wasn't such a successful exercise. Um, this is about my time slot tonight. It's something like half past twelve, or after that, after between midnight and one, which anywhere but a May ball you would think of as utter lunacy. Uh, but on the scale of an evening which people get through. Uh, until 6 a.m. it's probably it's not well they do if they don't part that um, it's actually not a bad time slot what the audience will be like though is a difficult question I sort of uh, I feel as if Queens in particular is still sort of my pack I feel like as if I know that audience I know the university and certainly the college but there's no escaping the fact that I am now quite a bit older than when all those things were true I'm 35 now like it or not it's 14 years since I actually graduated so it's quite likely that things have changed more than I admit. Whether that has a bearing on the gig is impossible to know. M my guess is that because it's one in the morning is about, say, halfway through a May ball, I reckon it's not a bad time to go on. People should have gone through the initial spur of drinking like lunatics and be sort of quite uh, blissful. It's but it is very difficult, really, to guess. A ball is quite, a y even for someone that I've now done an awful lot of gigs, but there's nothing quite like a May ball it's almost impossible to anticipate what the crowd will be like. Even the fact that you don't know who will be there or how many of them there'll be because of the nature of a ball. People are uh, at liberty to drift up to the tent, listen for five minutes, and then piss off again. And that is, it's only a May balls and also festivals. You, these days there's comedy tents and music festivals. Um, and uh, again, there you have the experience of talking like this for 10 minutes and then someone halfway through a sentence just gets up and leaves. And it may be no insult to you. They might have just gone to the toilet or they've just they've gone to see Mumford and Sons, um, <laughs> which I, for all I know, they might be on tonight. That's the other thing, you never know what else is going on at a ball. It's quite possible you'll be halfway through a joke and then drum and bass starts up in the next tent <laughs> and you have a sinking feeling that's gonna, again, no. I mean, I'm talking about 2001. I don't know if they have drum and bass anymore. <laughs> There's probably grime these days. Um, so I think at this point, we'll broaden that to see if um, audience members have any questions they'd like to ask. So just put your hand up and we'll get our microphone to you. Yep. 
Just over here. Hello. Um, a lot of my um, my um, favourites, um, well, like, uh, 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 a lot of, um, the, of your work, which I've most enjoyed, have um, as, as been things like um, your your show, like Mark Watson makes the world substantially better, and where uh, a lot of a lot of the dynamic works um, with you um, bumping off people like um, Tim Keys and 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 Tim Minchin. I, I, I was wondering, is is that is that sort of you know, like having you know, like you know, having having multiple people in in or on acts. Does it, does it, is 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 that something you you, know, you, uh, you find works work, works works well for you, or, or you know, do you uh, do you, do you, uh, do you prefer to be more uh, more solo? Well, it depends. I mean, stand up is quite obviously uh, an individualistic thing, and part of the thing that I love about stand up is that you, you uh, and it's rather an obvious thing to say, but you really are on your own. If it goes well, all of the glory is yours. All of the um, the ego that comes with it is yours, and if it goes badly, the, um, the misery is yours alone as well. So uh, stand-up is, is um, I kind of relish the fact that um, if I did think up a joke as I was walking up onto the stage, which does sometimes happen, I could just tell it, it might not work, but it would be my uh, responsibility. So there are a lot of things about the autonomy of stand-up that I really value, uh, but if you are fortunate enough to collaborate with people that, um, that you think are funny and funny in a way that you yourself can't be um, which is true of both Tim Key and Tim Minchin in their different ways and Tom Basden who is on my radio show these days that is quite a uh, that's a really enriching experience I, I think that's what you want from collaborators people who, who um, do something that you, you, you just can't aspire to do because it's either completely different or just better <laughs> um, on the other hand, collaborating with people that you don't see eye to eye with, in forced collaboration, like on TV shows, you're often forced to work with a bunch of people that you don't have much in common with, either artistically or uh, personally, and that can be pretty painful. So I'd say that uh, collaboration with people that, that uh, you want to work with is among the most rewarding aspects of the career. But uh, having to, especially with comedy, having to try and be funny with people uh, that you're not comfortable with or that you don't necessarily think are funny yourself is among the worst experiences. So it can go either way, yeah. But in general, I don't think I'm a natural collaborator. Most of my work is stand-up uh, in a live setting on my own. And then there are I write books as well. And most of the things I've chosen to do with my life are basically quite, well, not with my life, I suppose, but with my career are fairly solitary pursuits, yeah. There are people who... And that's probably another reason why I was never that heavily involved in Footlights, actually. There were people I was uh, aware of who really relished um, sitting around a table, having ideas together, bouncing ideas around, as people say. And I never really liked that. And even now, I don't like it. The thought of being on a, like a sitcom writing team where everyone takes turns to pitch an idea and everyone... I, I find that very difficult, I think. I, my natural bent is to just sort of lock myself away for a year and then come out with a book. Um, or, or a comedy show, as it might be. Um, so I've never felt the need to be in a regular writing team, but somebody like of the calibre of Tim Key, um, y you would make an exception for. Key, I met during the Footlight show, but he wasn't actually at Cambridge, famously. He's now famous. Um, he was at Sheffield, but he lived in Cambridge. So he went to the auditions uh, as a ringer and claimed to be a postgraduate at Sydney Sussex, um, which he could get away with because his brother had been at Sydney so he knew the layout of the college a bit and um, nobody questioned it then he'd been cast in the Footlight show and it was too late to uh, get him out of it but people started to smell a rat because uh, we once had a meeting at Sydney Sussex and he clearly didn't have a clue where anything was um, but the bar was locked, that's right, the bar was locked uh, unexpectedly so the director said is there another room we could use and from Key's reaction it was clear he'd never set foot in Sydney Sussex for any length of time <laughs> And shortly after that, he had to come out as not being from the university at all. And um, in a way, that sums him up quite well. Uh, very funny, but not somebody that you can always trust to do what you, what you want. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yeah, just go over here. <coughs> when you're preparing show or new material, how do you kind of go about it? Do you think about funny things that have happened, or do you try and create stuff just off the bat? Like, what's your technique? style um, my personal technique is to um, have I have kind of um, well it used to be a notebook a, a, a literal notebook these days I have a, um, a file on my phone and if anything remotely funny comes into my head I'll uh, note it down and then very gradually start to sort of try and weave uh, routines out of that kind of handful of notes 
But for me, it is a process which mostly takes place on stage. The way I develop material is basically to do enough gigs that I can try lots of things and um, filter out the, the ones that work from the ones that don't. Not all comedians do work like that. There are comedians who um, approach writing a show as a matter of actually putting almost scripts to paper and then um, essentially performing that. But for me, I, I pretty much, um, it's a more I sort of long-winded way of doing it, but I, I ha almost have to develop jokes by um, just trying them out. So if a thing happened that I thought had funny potential, I'd talk about it on stage, and the first time I would more or less describe it as it happened, but maybe try and have a punchline at the end. And then very gradually, a as you'll have done it yourself, any story you tell uh, has the potential to be embellished, and the more times you tell it, the more um, expert you become at telling it, and it does become funnier. Um, so for me, uh, my shows essentially are like that. They start as skeletons, and then they are sort of um, painstakingly built up until they become uh, shows. For that, you need a lot of time. You need to work hard. You need to do an awful lot of shows, and you also need uh, the guts to know that sometimes you'll say stuff that just isn't funny, and people will look at you uh, either pityingly or perhaps even angrily thinking, I paid to see a proper show, but you're quite clearly using us as guinea pigs. Um, the way to get around it is to do, I will tend to do shows that are billed as a work in progress. I'm doing one at the junction next month, in fact. So the audience hopefully knows that they're seeing something which is not fully formed and which will develop into something that is fully formed. Um, I, the way I do it like that, um, the reason rather, the reason I do it like that is simply because you can write stuff that you think is as funny as you could imagine, but until you have tried it out in front of audiences, you've simply not got any idea. I've never had a joke so foolproof um, that immediately I thought, that will definitely work. I don't think I've ever had a joke or anything, even, even things which I've thought of that have made me laugh, which is rare, I'm still not at all confident. And until the moment you put it in front of an audience, it's extremely hard to be sure what will be funny. Um, and again, with, with uh, theatre or with most forms, with sketches even, you do have the luxury of rehearsing and putting it in front of a director maybe, or someone, someone can tell you what is funny about something. With stand-up, uh, and this is another aspect of the aloneness of it, you, you really have no idea whether something in your head will translate into something that works um, in real life. So I think stand-up, more than most disciplines, r requires quite a, ma uh, quite a large <coughs> amount of taking risks in front of an audience. And um, you either have the temperament for that or you don't, basically. Cool. Uh, yeah, just a question over here. Oh, sorry, give it for microphone. Yeah. Yeah. We'll observe the etiquette, even though. Etiquette. No, you are, you're close enough. <laughs> I probably would have heard you. But, uh, um, yeah. You say you're not sure how the May ball is going to go this evening, and you say that your next gig at the junction is going to be a work in progress. So would you like to try out some of your material <laughs> on us? No, I can assure you I wouldn't, no. Um, but, um, and the funny thing is that the, the, the reason I, that I'd be even more resistant uh, than most comedians to doing that is that um, an awful lot of comedy does depend on uh, setting an expectation, I think. If I'd come out here uh, this afternoon and immediately launched into a routine, I mean, it would have been pretty awkward for all of you, <laughs> but uh, at, at least I think we, we probably could have made that work. Whereas once you've set a precedent that you were um, uh, very much sitting in an armchair talking about the war, uh, you, you, um, it, it becomes extremely hard to flip into... Um, doing comedy. Whereas at the May Ball, I, I'm sort of banking quite heavily on the fact that people, they might not, they probably won't know who I am, but they will at least, uh, they'll know what sort of thing they're going to see. And it's surprising how often, I mean, there it was kind of, it was a legitimate question, but uh, in plenty of completely non-performative uh, contexts, for example, being in a taxi or having a haircut, people will ask you, so do you want to do a bit of your, give us a joke, do, do say something funny, and um, you, it's, it's, um, I can't emphasise how bad an experience it is to be only halfway through a haircut and someone starts asking for jokes because <laughs> it's not a situation you can easily leave. Um, at least with a taxi, you could just say, just drop me here. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, I'm also the sort of offstage, relatively bashful person. I don't generally like to do that kind of thing anyway. There are some comedians that could do it, but they're mostly one-liner uh, merchants. I'm often quite jealous of people like uh, Milton Jones or Tim Vine, who have uh, easy access to um, one-liners without even having to think. 
because those people, if they're asked for a joke, can actually do a joke. Virtually all of my jokes depend on an exhaustive setup, uh, rambling, and on the context of a comedy show. So I've, I, the few times I have responded to someone saying, give us a joke with one of my own bits, it's always been a disaster. So now if a tax driver asks for a joke, I'll just do someone else's joke. I've got two or three that I use. <laughs> I always credit the original person. I'll say, well, I'll give you, I'll give you such and such a person's joke. Um, and yeah, that is why I think it's easy to forget that because stand-up looks very effortless, or if it's done well, it looks effortless. Someone just walks onto the stage, chats, people laugh, uh, especially under lights and with the, with the uh, paraphernalia of a comedy club. It's easy to think, ah, oh, all he's doing is talking, and in a way, it's absolutely right. But um, a lot of artifice goes into making it look like it is a natural thing to do. And uh, as soon as you take that away, for example, uh, on a bus, you, you immediately appreciate that um, stand-up requires... It's, it's in a way, it's similar to... If someone was um, renowned for playing Hamlet, if you said, do a bit of the old to be or not to be, and they struck up doing that, say, in a park, it wouldn't be anywhere near as impressive as I think. And, and for the same reason, which is that an audience brings a certain uh, expectation to something without which what you're doing makes hardly any sense. So that was a very long way of saying, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone else got any questions? But actually something, oh yeah? Oh, hurt. I'd just start from um, Is there anyone around, either at the moment or in the past, who you wish you could be more like in your comedy, or you wish you could do what they do? Well, uh, there are a few. Um, there's uh, Tim Key, who has already been mentioned, is um, one of them. Uh, I don't know, uh, you may not have come across, chances are you won't have come across him, um, but he is a very difficult act to describe. He, uh, the people that I envy, uh, or, or wish to be more like, tend to be, it's sort of a paradox, uh, people that I could never do anything remotely like what they do. Um, comedians who, I'm thinking of people like Tim Key, uh, Paul Foot. some of these names will be familiar to some people. Um, uh, people who, uh, there's an Australian guy called Sam Simmons, who do something which, although it still is stand-up or related to stand-up, it's completely different. Even though I've done quite a lot of odd uh, projects in my career. I've never entirely been able to break the mould of, sort of standing up and talking largely anecdotally about stuff that happens to me. There are comedians who are completely fearless when it comes to subject matter um, and, uh, and style and everything. And I always kind of wish to be like those people while also accepting that I, I could never um, quite do it. I mean, there are plenty of comedians out there like uh, Dara Brain or... Um, Lee Mack, Chris Addison, I could name a dozen comedians who are observational comics that I uh, look up to and wish to emulate their talent. But I don't generally think I wish I was doing that because I'm aware that I sort of am doing that, if not as well. The people that I really wish to be like are um, people who generally, these people, like say Tim, uh, certainly Paul Foot and Simmons, uh, liberate themselves from the fear of an audience's reaction, I think. To be really kind of experimental and bold in what you do, you've got to pretty much turn off the part of your brain that worries, will this go well? Will people like this? And it's not to say you don't notice or care. Key certainly cares whether a show goes well or not, but he is able to subdue the part of his brain that says, hang on, you shouldn't be doing this. All you're doing is just reading out a poem and eating crackers. Um, <laughs> you know, most of us do have that. Most of us have a thing in our brain saying, you mustn't just light that firework now. Uh, you, you know, um, and, and, and we have that uh, faculty for a pretty good reason, which is that a lot of stuff like that isn't good. I never saw the firework man, so I don't know. But 90% <laughs> of us don't, even if you were to do comedy, you wouldn't do that, because quite rightly, your intuition would be that this would be a terrible. But to be, I don't know if genius is the word, but to, to be the absolute top rank of um, performers, or for that matter, probably writers, musicians, <coughs> one of the things that marks out a really special artist is that they're prepared to venture into the 10% uh, of creative activity that could be absolutely abject and humiliating because they know that the, the result could also be spectacular. I don't think I've ever quite been one of those people. I, I, you know, I, I think I can maintain a high standard within what I do, but I've never quite been able to dip my toe into um, pure lunacy because I'd have too much of a fear of what might happen. Another one? Oh, uh, yeah, just over here. Do you have a preference between writing and performing? Um, I, well, I'm quite, 
I'm fortunate to do both, really, because uh, writing and performing, the sort of writing I do, like novels and things, and, and then performing, they uh, complement each other fairly well. Um, because uh, writing is, in a lot of ways, more fulfilling um, and a more kind of uh, enriching, is not quite the word I want, but um, there is more probable long-term spiritual satisfaction to be had from writing, I think. Uh, there's there's the, the feeling of having written a book, having produced something concrete. All those things are quite valuable um, in, in a way that stand-up isn't necessarily because stand-up is uh, a gig is such a, a transient thing. It's, it's over in 20 minutes it, um, or an hour, even two hours, however long you spend with an audience. And I've done 24-hour long shows, but still, it fades quite quickly. Uh, so writing gives you a kind of long-term pleasure and sort of nourishment that you wouldn't get from that. On the other hand, the business of writing is incredibly slow. It takes a long time to do it. Uh, then it takes a long time for, for people to uh, edit your work, let alone for a book to be published. And any sort of writing that you do for TV, f for the stage, anything, um, it goes through so many iterations. There's so much messing about that I think if I were just writing, I, I wouldn't temperamentally quite be able to stand it. Uh, the drawn outness of it. Plus, of course, a lot of writing projects don't come off. You might spend a year on a novel and it not be published, or you certainly you might well spend a year on a film script and it never goes anywhere near being produced. So I don't think I could survive as a writer on its own um, because I really value the fact that as a comedian, you do have that nightly buzz. On the other hand, if you're just a comedian, you can quite easily become a nutter uh, because you're living from one high to another. You live mostly at night. Your day tapers towards this half hour adrenaline rush where you're the most important person in the room and you go back to your life where you're generally the least important person in the room. Um, Stand-up is also very competitive, as is writing, but you're less aware of your competitors as an author. In stand-up, you're pitted against people in quite a noticeable way. So uh, it's a precarious, stand-up is too precarious mentally, but writing is, is the business of it can be too tedious mentally. So I, although I prefer, I'd say I prefer writing if I were forced to say one or the other, but I personally don't think I could manage without having a bit of both. And I, I personally am really grateful that I have a career that allows me to do quite a range of things, radio, TV, uh, writing, book writing, because most of them um, are things that you would get sick of if they were the only thing. If you, and I, again, I don't think that is purely applies to writing or to comedy or to the arts. I think in general, I in life, it's a sound rule of thumb to have a few different things that you do, because there is always the chance that one of them won't work out, or that you just won't want to do any of them anymore. I think um, variety is a very useful, definitely for an artist, but, but for anyone, really, for a human. Okay. Other questions? So actually, oh yeah, do, yeah. I'll be back for another go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get something out of you before the end. <laughs> <laughs> Do you fear hecklers, and uh, how do you deal with hecklers? Well, actually, I, heckling uh, happens less than people imagine. It's, it's a fairly common uh, topic of conversation for a comedian. I mean, uh, in terms of, it's, it's a question that often comes up, but it's not something which you confront as much as one would think. It does happen quite a lot in the early days um, that's one of the things. Uh, these days, I, I, um, I, I, I'm lucky enough to have kind of a, a tour uh, theatres and perform at situations where I'm generally less likely to be heckled. Just because someone has come to see you, they're, um, they're more likely to invest in the show itself and not to want to disrupt it. Um, although, having said that, a, a ball like tonight's is a classic example of a situation where you, it is impossible to uh, predict what people's involvement might be. Um, Certainly, when I, when you're starting out, you, you do you do have to face quite a bit of it. The, the trouble with it, people often imagine that hecklers are um, full of wit, and uh, that you know there's this culture in comedy of elegant takedowns from audience members. And occasionally that does happen. Occasionally there is kind of the cut and thrust of genuine um, erudite banter, but quite often not. Quite often, some people uh, people are hammered, and they dare one of them to yell out, and the person does yell out. And you say, sorry, what was that? And then they don't repeat it. And then you've come to a cul-de-sac. So I only really fear hecklers in as much as it can be a massive, unwelcome disruption without anything funny coming out of it. What I don't fear is people being involved 
in the show. I, I quite often will chat to audience members. I like to ask open-ended questions of an audience so that someone maybe answers it and you can then um, chat to them. I, if you have faith that generally people want the show to go well, though if, if they chip in, it's because they have something funny to add, because it can happen. It can be that you end up in exchanges with people that are, um, genuinely do uh, end up being funny and they take the show in an unexpected way and partly people love comedy because there is that genuine and organic interaction between audience and performers so it's important to have that but um, it's disappointing how often hecklers are um, too drunk and occasionally they can really um, they can really spoil it there was somebody uh, I did a show in Hay on Wire the Hay Festival only a couple of weeks ago and um, it had been sponsored by someone that was um, close to the front row. Well, it was by her business. It was a mobile phone business, a mobile phone repair business, in fact. Um, so um, uh, she, as the sponsor, I had to thank her. I had to, at some point during the show, say, by the way, this is sponsored by this. Person. So I um, found out where the person was and spoke to her with the aim of um, it potentially being a funny conversation, partly because a mobile phone company is quite a depressingly prosaic sponsor at a place like Hay, which is an incredibly high-minded festival. Um, but it turned out she was drunk and she was a bit of a dick, so it didn't really work out. <laughs> um, the in this initial interaction was funny enough, but then because I'd invited her in, she then chipped in every five minutes or so, and people around her became more and more restless until I eventually had to ask her to um, be quiet, which some comedians would have done very aggressively. I just pretty much in these words said, you've out grown your usefulness now or something like that um, and uh, which was a polite way of saying for fuck's sake shut up um, and I will always do that even with hecklers who genuinely are a pain I will I will try to um, kind of meet them halfway as it were partly because I'm just not a confrontational person in the way that some comedians are and partly because a difficult thing about your relationship with a heckler is they probably still have paid she hasn't she was a sponsor she was there on a freebie which m gave me less compunction about saying her to shut up if someone's paid 10 or 15 quid to be in the room, so they don't have the right to ruin the show for other people, but you do have to be a little bit more careful, I think, about insulting them. I've seen comedians lay into people who have only, they've maybe said one silly thing, or they've just been, a, they've muttered something a bit too audibly, and, but still they're a paying audience member. Stand-up comedy is one of the only things where you can pay money and then the person you paid it to abuses you for an hour. <laughs> uh, and then you're, uh, you're meant to just clap and say, that was great, wasn't it? <laughs> and that person is not the, way, the relationship I like to have with a paying public. So yeah, I only fear hecklers when there is not a funny way of dealing with them and yet they still have to be dealt with. Do you have one last question? No, I think we'll end it there then. I, so I just want to say thank you so much for coming and can we have a warm round of applause? Thank you, yeah, thanks for coming. Best of luck with Queens. Ooh, yeah, thanks very much for coming. Thanks. Right. I've just sucked myself up for seven hours now. Yeah. These chairs you can kind of sink into them. Oh, yeah, because they're for ages. <laughs> they're like, yeah. They're quite comfortable. I think.